Dear Arjan, what is the best way to reduce material desire? Good question. Two things to reflect on, very helpful. One is around death. And a little later in the retreat we will be doing some death reflection. When we practice death reflection, awareness of death, it becomes kind of obvious that whatever we've been able to accumulate, no matter how much we liked it, we can't take it with us, not a single thing. And so when we really accept that this body is heading towards death and every day that death comes closer and we understand that at the moment of death we have to let it all go, if we really get that on a deep level, we understand there's not much point accumulating much stuff. And you notice that that desire tends to get weakened if we're really mindful of death, or at the very least, when the desire comes up, there's some wisdom arises which can counter the greed. It's like, well, you can't take it with you when you die anyway. The only thing you can take with you is the merit that you accumulated and the bad karma that you accumulated. They go together. And the other thing that goes with you is your tendencies, so your latent tendencies. So whatever tendencies you've cultivated towards, practicing dana, sila, bhavana, being generous, ethical, meditating, that goes with you as a tendency, part of your character. This is the other reflection about material desire is that whatever tendency you've cultivated towards grasping and being greedy and wanting lots of beautiful things, that goes with you. So you get reborn as somebody greedy. So that's a good thing to remember. In my family, one of my brothers and sisters, I won't mention their names, but my father mentioned, actually he used to be quite critical of me when I was young, but he said something nice to me recently. He said, I remember, Achlo, when you were a little boy, whenever you were eating lifesavers or candies, if I wanted one, he would always give me one very happily. And then he mentioned the name of this other brother or sister, and he said, but when I even asked this person, they'd start crying at the very thought. So this is interesting, isn't it, that even as a child, you can ask a child for a candy, and at the very thought of giving up the candy, they're already crying tendency towards clinging, some kind of a belief that if you give something away you've lost it. But then another child, even in childhood, someone asks for something, okay, there's a tendency there, isn't there? Somebody's trained in giving, letting go, you know the joy of sharing. So we have these tendencies even as children. The other thing to remember about material desire is that the more you grasp at the idea of the things that you want and the more you go out of your way to get them the more karma that you're making with being born in this realm of forms so with desire for things comes fuel for the next body and you just have to think about that sometimes contemplation of death is powerful but sometimes contemplation of rebirth is even more powerful do you really want another childhood do you want to go through primary school, infant school, kindergarten? Do you want to be a teenager again? Do you want to have to go through university again? Do you want that experience of mothers-in-law, fathers-in-law? Do you want the first divorce, the second divorce, the third divorce? I think about it. As many challenges, pains, frustrations, disappointments you've had this life, as well as many dreams come true, prizes, rewards, praise, treasure, all of the good stuff and all of the bad stuff, 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. Let's do it all again. So, the more you act on getting the stuff that you want, okay, it's arising as a craving, when you start to act because you want it, you're making karma. And when you get it, you're making karma. And the amount of delight that you have when you get it, you're making karma. So you're creating this tendency to want the next thing. It's very scary. And you can see where it goes in this age of billionaires. We used to talk about millionaires, now we talk about billionaires. 
and just observe their lives. One billion isn't enough. You need two, three, four, five, ten, twenty billion. That's where materialism goes if we don't check it, if we don't fight it, if we don't go against it. And it makes a lot of bad karma because if you do become really greedy, the way you make a lot of money, the way you make your business the most successful, the most powerful, is of course by taking out your competition. So there's actually only so much wealth in the world and if you want it all, it means that you increase poverty. So you have to think up campaigns and methods and schemes. You can squeeze the middle class, you can crush the middle class so that you can be really, really rich and everyone else is poor. And of course the karma of that, you probably have to be reborn a thousand times as somebody poor. So it's really scary actually, the implications of greed and what it causes people to do. So as well as the contemplation of death, very valuable, contemplation of rebirth, the more karma that you make with greed, the more karma that you make with craving and grasping, the more lives that you have. And as much as you can practice renunciation, as much as you can grow in the path of dana and renunciation, letting go, the fewer lives that you have. It really is that simple. So contemplating when you die, you can't take any of it with you. The only thing you take with you is your good and bad karma can be a tendency in Asia, I want to get rich, then I'll make a lot of offerings to a Sangha. And we can justify some of the things that we do. I'm doing this so that I can be rich, so that I can support the Sangha. Well, there's nobody in the Sangha that encourages you to do evil things so that you can give to the Sangha. True members of the Sangha encourage you to grow in dana, maintain your sila impeccably. There's this phrase that my teacher in Thailand uses often, Arya Sap, which means the noble wealth. The noble wealth is the mindfulness, the concentration, the wisdom that you've cultivated, the sila, your tendency towards being generous and virtuous. This is noble wealth, Barami. It's right there in your heart. So you will have some of this. That's why you're here doing the retreat. You will have some noble wealth. And this is the most valuable thing. You look at these beautiful examples of the foremost in generosity in the time of the Buddha, Anattapindika and Visakha. They had so much wealth and the thing that gave them the most joy was giving it all away. That's why they were wealthy. They didn't accumulate their wealth by stealing or competing or vying or wheeling and dealing. They were born into it. Wisaka once had, I think it took a month or months to refine the gold, to make the jewelry. She didn't just have a crown or rings, she had a dress made of jewels and gold for her wedding. Once she forgot it in the entrance hall to the Jetavana, she forgot her wedding jewels. And she took that to be a symbol that she should give them up. And so she said, Whoever can buy these jewels, I'll build a new monastery for the Buddha. And then she realized that nobody could afford it. Nobody could afford Visaka's wedding jewels. So she decided that she'd buy them from herself. She worked out what the value was and she sold other properties so that she could come up with that amount in cash or gold. And she kept the jewels but she sold lots of other things and then with that money she built another monastery. And the Buddha spent several rains retreats in that monastery. That's also in Savati. So realizing that she had this very precious thing that no one could afford, she sold everything she could so that she could have that vast amount of money and then she built the whole monastery. Anatta Pindika did the same thing. He didn't just buy the land from Prince Jeta. He built the hall, the kutis. He had ponds made, paths, walking paths, walls, entrance halls. He almost went bankrupt. But he didn't regret his generosity for a second. He was overjoyed with having been able to build a monastery for the Buddha and the great disciples. So that's someone who has cultivated the noble wealth. They have dana barami, they have renunciation barami. They can give it all away and they feel great joy doing it. And the result is they end up with more. But they don't end up with more because they want it. 
it's the result of their merit. So coming and practicing meditation like this, it's very good. We get to see our desires and we get to practice letting go of them. We get to see things in a bit of perspective. Is it really worth it, this thing I think I want? We can challenge it a bit. Recently in my own experience, some curious things coming up. I once had a mala, some prayer beads made of amber, beautiful gold color like that roof outside, and I loved it. And I gave it to my teacher, Ajahn Anand. An interesting thing happened. A couple of years later, somebody gave me a Buddha statue carved from one piece of amber. It was beautiful, big one, very valuable. So I gave that to the Dalai Lama. I also once had, after I gave away the amber mala, somebody gave me a lapis mala. And so I, I showed that to Ajahn Sumedho when I was living in England. He said, that color blue is my favorite color. So I gave him that mala. And also I have a friend who used to design jewelry and I was talking with her, what's a good present for the Dalai Lama? She said, why don't we give him a mala? So she had some turquoise from Tibet. And I thought, okay, let's give a Tibetan turquoise mala to the Dalai Lama. And so I did. And so since I left Thailand, without having asked for them, Miss Lee gave me a crystal mala with Om Mani Padme Hum carved in every bead. Very beautiful. Chai Aik gave me another beautiful mala. And the nun of this monastery gave me another one. <laughs> so that's what happens when you give stuff away. It comes back more than you can use. I left my monastery with three malas and now I have ten. <laughs> so when I go back I'm going to have to give some away. <laughs> So it really is like that. And giving that amber Buddha statue to the Dalai Lama, I really love that statue. But the joy that comes from giving something that you love to someone you respect is much more fulfilling than the joy of having something. But what's interesting is there's a beautiful sandstone Buddha statue at the monastery I've been building and everybody loves that Buddha. Such a beautiful face. It looks peaceful, wise, it has metta in the expression on the face. It looks nice in every light, in every season, even when it's wet, it looks nice. And I suspect that it's partly due to having given that beautiful statue to the Dalai Lama. Now Anandikiri has a really big one, that one weighs one ton. So things come back when we give them up, things come back in surprising ways. You end up with more nice stuff than you ever imagined if you give it in the right way, in the right attitude to the right people. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about faith. We were talking about faith this morning and practicing with faith. So that's another thing. We can have faith in dana, faith in the benefits of relinquishing and contemplating the drawbacks of grasping. Faith, when it's the right kind of faith, gives us power to do much more than we think we can. It's bigger than the self. So recently I had an occasion, an opportunity to make a lot of good karma in Australia. The people who organize the Dalai Lama's teaching tour invited me to lead an optional guided meditation before his main teaching on the second day of the teachings. So that meant having to sit in the middle of the stage alone at the entertainment center in Sydney. And the entertainment center is its black. All of the walls are black and there's all these black curtains. And so it would mean sitting in this big black space on the stage alone with spotlights on you and a microphone the microphone is so good. You can hear every little bit of dry mouth, every little bit of throat clear, every little bit of nervous quiver. It's all there in Dolby stereo. So it's very scary. But I thought, what could I do that could be better to express my gratitude and respect to the lineage that I ordained in other than teaching breath meditation and Buddha? What a wonderful way 
to honour my teachers and what could be a better thing to bring back to my country and to the Buddhists or the people interested in Buddhism than these very practical methods stretching back to the Bodhi tree in India and the Buddha's enlightenment so I thought I have to try and also what could be better offering to the Dalai Lama even better than an amber Buddha statue would be to help the people coming to listen to be peaceful and then dedicate the merit to his long life so I knew I'd be scared but I knew that if I had faith in the good intention of the people my good intention then I might be able to get over those nerves and basically step out of the way because it's not about me it's about meditation it's about mindfulness but when confronted with the idea of the stage the spotlight the microphone the black space at the entertainment center there is a sense of self a bit scared comes up and so another thing I did was I asked everybody I knew to please spread loving kindness to me at that time because when we have Kalyanamitta when we feel like we have a few friends on our side that also helps to be brave so I did lead that guided meditation about 2,000 people came and after the first few words just kind of relaxing trusting in the pure intention trusting in the pure intention of the people dropping Achalo's fear and just focusing on the method with the pure intention may these people be peaceful so that they understand the teachings may we make a lot of good karma and then dedicate that to the Dalai Lama after a minute or so I actually felt this incredible love coming from many directions that would have been all the people that were praying for me I was very grateful and it all went very well that would have been impossible for Achalo Bhikkhu to do even just five years ago and the only reason I can do it is this faith faith in goodness faith in Dhamma and just trusting when you really have faith in the Dhamma the impossible can become possible so just saying that by word of encouragement keep practicing what seems impossible is possible tomorrow will probably also be a quicksand day a walking up the mountain day might not be that's the other thing about the mind is you never know when you come to do your meditation is it going to be blissful is it going to be hell you don't know don't get fixed perceptions it's going to be really hard sometimes it was really hard and all of a sudden empty space peace joy and sometimes it was really peaceful you can't wait to get back and you sit and it's like oh, where'd the peace go and all of that's fine just getting interested in the process allowing it to be the way it is laying the causes sowing the causes peace also comes and goes but there's not much that we can do which is better than what we're doing so we just surrender to the process and do our best coming back to the breath one in breath and one out breath 